Because what I would like to get from, uh, from this event is not much me presenting to you, say, in a one-way fashion, but rather more of a kind of conversation, right? Uh, a conversation around issues that I guess are of common interest, that is uh, forms of representation of knowledge, uh, forms in which data is visualized, mapped out, and the political significance of these operations. Right? Uh, what I want to talk about today is the nexus between info visualization and political activism. And this is, I think, uh, uh, a connection that is interesting in general uh, to get to grips with the role of data in our society, but it's also of interest directly uh, to me and other people, uh, other colleagues, uh, Mark, Tobias, many others uh, in digital humanities, who are thinking of working on these issues in the future, right? And of using info visualization as, uh, as a means for, uh, for the analysis of data, for the analysis of social media messages, and so on and so forth. So to give you a summary, uh, what I want to do is to discuss this connection between social media, between info visualization and, and activism, and to look at uh, possible ways uh, to uh, evolve, to move forward in the use of info visualization as a means of investigation, and as a means of uh, uh, political reflection. So, InfoVis, that stands for Info Visualization, is a um, set of practices that we encounter in our everyday life uh, more and more often. And that are fundamentally involved in mapping out uh, a world of data. I mean, this data scape, uh, this uh, uh, world of bits of information that becomes more and more uh, significant in quantity, and that becomes also more and more difficult to grapple with. Right? So we all know about the debate about big data, we all know about the debate about information overload, we all know that we live in the world in which the quantity of data that concerns us is increasing significantly, and this raises questions about the way in which we can handle that information, how we, how we can handle that data. And in, in this context, we've witnessed the rise of a series of forms of uh, information visualization that are, to a great extent, that uh, tell us that they are, to a great extent, a form uh, to get to grips with that sea of data, right? To give us a sense of what this data is about, how the data connects with other data, how uh, there are how basically this data is structured and organized. Right? It allows us to navigate, to orientate ourselves into this space. Right? And here you have several examples of that. Uh, over there you have uh, an info visualization that maps out email conversation. This one is a Twitter map, uh, match with a, a geographic map. This is a, a map of LinkedIn, right? This is a map of uh, Twitter traffic uh, around hashtags connected with Occupy Wall Street. They are very different kind of, uh, of, of uh, info visualization, right? Some of them are more conceptual, some of them are more geographical, but they all share uh, the kind of belonging to this family of practices called InfoVis. And InfoVis is uh, a field of practice that is on the rise, it's more and more on the rather. Uh, there are dedicated websites, infosetics, information is beautiful, visual complexity, flowing data. There are dedicated conferences, I, IO Festival, uh, and other conferences. And one of the main reasons of the fortune of, uh, of InfoV is precisely has to do with this rise and this fashion of big data. Right? So in a world of big data, uh, people feel compelled to have tools, uh, instruments that can allow them to process data, right? Because as we know all too well, 
the question is not much to have data available. It's not much to have uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of information available. The question is how to interpret the data, how to find significant relationships, significant correlations within the data, right? how to give a meaning to the data. And that's precisely what information visualization is largely involved, uh, is largely responsible for doing. So we will live now in a time in which info visualization has become something mainstream, something extremely popular. But what I want to do uh, in this presentation is to trace with the roots of info visualization as a practice that was very strongly connected with the counterculture, with activist culture, and with the anti-globalization movement back in the 90s and in the 2000s. So there was, around the time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, a cultural movement involved in media activism that has very different manifestations, uh, ranging from indie media to the creation of uh, alternative uh, list serves. And this uh, field of practices also saw the emergence of political net artists, various groups that experimented with uh, the internet as a technology that allowed for new forms of expression. And within this series of forms of expression, a very privileged role was played precisely by by information visualization, by different forms of visualization that allowed activists to represent the new world that was emerging around them, the new world of globalization, this new world of global interconnectedness, a world that somehow uh, was characterized by different features than the, the world of the nation state, the world of national politics, the world that was characterized by the emergence of flows, of communication, of migration, of capital, and a space that called forth for new forms of visualization to allow people to understand it and engage with it. I'll show you now some examples of these practices. This is an uh, info -biz from 2004, right? So this is very kind of early times of. Uh, InfoViz was produced by an artist called Josh On, and it's called They Rule. They, who are they? They are the corporate executives, the corporate rich. I mean, what C. Bright Mills called the kind of the corporate rich, the corporate elites, right? And what this project is, is fundamentally a database of all the corporate boards in the US, which shows something very interesting that are the fact that a board is not something isolated from other boards. Actually, there are people who are sitting on several boards at the same time, right? And therefore, it conveys the sense that I mean, capitalism is not really this world of separate enterprises fighting one against the other, lowering the price, price wars, and so on and so forth, but actually is a more of a world of collusion, a sort of mafia-like system in which there is this fat, fat guy who is both on J.P. Morgan Chase and Abbott Laboratories, as this guy who is both on this board and that board, but it conveys the sense of the structure of power that um, operates there. And a structure of power where, again, is different from the sort of narrative we get about capitalism as a system of perfect competition. Another example is Logical Land. This was a map by Matthias Brunner and other colleagues. What this map was doing was to utilize a series of database, uh, databases about very basic demographic information. Say, land surface, population, uh, GDP per capita, um, connectivity, stats. And it was producing, it was representing the different nations according to this data, right? So this is the map that represents the world according to land surface, right? So it's the most familiar one because it resembles a bit the classical uh, map uh, that, that we are used to see. But then if you click on population, for example, you would see that China is much bigger than it is here, right? Or you would see that India would become much bigger. If you click on income per capita, you would see the reverse happening, right? You would see uh, so-called global south countries, 
becoming the, 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 the square for global south country becoming much smaller. So what this is, is again another example of a form of representation that was concerned once again with this rise of a global space. There was somehow a sort of unknown territory, a mysterious territory, in which uh, people felt the urge to orientate themselves, to make sense of how different world regions that people read about in the news, they were involved, for example, in trade treaties across different countries, how they fared in terms of several indicators. It was a sort of process, part of a process of global alphabetization, right? Getting to grips with this emerging global world, this world of global power and global interconnectedness. This is another example. This is a project by Mauricio Orango, and it's called Vanishing Point. And it is quite a familiar uh, cartographic map. But we see that there is, I mean, the main difference is in terms of colors, right? So you see there are different shades of gray in this info visualization. Uh, and with some countries uh, where the shade is darker and other countries where the shade is lighter. Um, the reason for this difference in shades uh, was dependent on the news visibility of these countries. Right? Mauricio Arango devised a database that was counting the number of occurrences of uh, the, the name of those countries in international news, right? international wires. Right? And then according uh, to the uh, visibility of these countries in the news, the country with darker shades right, are the more visible while the lighter ones are, are less visible. So for example, this shows you how basically most of Africa is not visible in the news, doesn't appear in the news. How our international news are obsessed with, guess what? The US, uh, Europe, right? China, India, we're already surfacing there. Iraq, for obvious reasons, Iran, right? And this, once again, was an exercise precisely in that, once again. So getting to grips with this global space, getting a sense of uh, how different global forces were operating in this space, and, and using data uh, in a way, in, representing data in a way that would allow people to, to handle it, to use it in a, in a meaningful way. Here's another example. This comes more from a kind of designer, more than a uh, really pure activist field. This is uh, a project called News Map by Marcos Westcamp. I think this one was dated back to 2005, this project. What this map, yes, it's 2005. What this project tried to do was to use a, a new phenomenon, a new service that was emerging around the time that was Google News. Right. Google News as a data gathering platform, right? uh, pulling data from very different sources inside the same platform and then serving it to users. And what it showed there was how there is a hierarchy in news. Right? There is a hierarchy, a visibility hierarchy in terms of the things we see, in terms of uh, the events we are exposed to, in terms of the issues, the problems that we are alerted about. Right. Ranging from war news to uh, national news. Right. And once again, this type of representation utilized the numbers, crunch numbers from data sets about news, and then represented them in this very uh, simplified and efficacious way. This is another example of this uh, uh, imaginary of cartography, of alternative cartography, of information visualization. And this, this is a, a picture that comes from possibly the most famous artist within this net art scene that developed between the end of the 90s and the beginning of the notice, Jody. Jody being this net artist who uh, played, pushed to the limits, pushed to the limits the, uh, the functioning of uh, Web 1.0 by using all the 
different JavaScript code that was available at the time, HTML, in the most, in the weirdest way possible to show really the, um, the complexity of communication on the web. What this is, is a map that resembles a network map back from the 70s or 80s, right, in style. I mean, for techies and geeks, the kind of uh, uh, reference is quite uh, direct, right? And what this is, is a backbone map, right? But a backbone map of the net art scene itself. So the names of the nodes are actually the names of art collectives, net art collectives, right? such as uh, Mongrel over there, uh, such as uh, 01001100101.org. It was the name of a group, an Italian net artist group, right? And, and several others. And I think that this is quite interesting because all the other maps that you have seen before were somehow maps of the outside world, maps of the other, right? maps of this war people wanted to get to grips with, or maps of the enemy, such as in the case of the Eru, right? So maps of the enemy's field that somehow acts as a preparation device to then attack the enemy, right? While this map is a map of the self, is a, is a self-representation, right? is a representation of the movement, uh, that uh, seemingly emerges out of a year of urge to define oneself as a scene, as part of a coherent collective actor, this net art scene that was uh, present in, in those days. So the important thing is that this range of practices was not just the result of technological affordances emerging around the time. It uh, certainly was, right? It certainly was, it certainly stemmed from the impression that new technologies um, struck on activists, uh, the demonstration of possibility, the realization of what people could do with those technologies. But at the same time, uh, alongside the sort of the technological opportunity that was opening up, there was also a cultural tradition that activists were uh, building upon. And this cultural tradition came mainly from conceptual art. From conceptual art where a number of artists in previous years had precisely experimented with diagrams, with uh, uh, infographics, with various forms of information visualization and alternative cartography as political devices. I mean, among others, also the famous German artist Hans Ake had used the language of diagrams, for example, to represent processes of gentrification going on in New York. A very important reference there uh, was this artist called Mark Lombardi. Uh, Mark Lombardi was this New York artist who was actually in his uh, everyday life was a librarian who uh, started in his late life, I mean in his 50s, to develop uh, these artworks that have been published as part of a, of a book called uh, Global Networks. And what these artworks were, were uh, an attempt to map out a number of issues, right? Uh, for example, scandals involving different politicians, businessmen. There is a very famous graph diagram like this where he is depicting the connection between George Bush, uh, oil companies in Texas, and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabian people somehow anticipating what would have happened uh, later on. And it really borders a bit on kind of conspiracy theory, right, on representing this uh, world of hidden connections. But again, it is uh, uh, a demonstration, a reflection of this urge to uh, draw the links, to draw the connections. It is an extremely complex world in which for the ordinary man and woman it is extremely hard to make sense of this vast amount of information. Uh, these type of experiments are precisely about trying to challenge that situation, trying to uh, elaborate, <coughs> trying to process the information and 
present it in a meaningful and manageable form. So what Mark Lombardi did uh, to develop these projects was basically uh, he collected press clippings right, about different issues. He had the user archive and then he had cards. He was a librarian, right? So he knew how to, <laughs> to organize information. So he had cards for different characters, right? And then he would uh, write connections. So you had a card, say, for George Bush. And he would write then all the connections that were emerging out of the articles, right? So for example, if in an article was mentioning in the same article, say, George Bush and an oil entrepreneur from Texas, that oil entrepreneur would end up in the card with George Bush and the other way around as well. And it was a sort of uh, a paper database, right, what he maintained, that, um, that then constituted a source for developing these, uh, these visualizations. Another example of uh, this conceptual art <coughs> comes from, uh, sorry, here the, the title is wrong, comes from Bureau de Tude and their famous series on, on global power, the global power system. I mean, the picture is too small for you to see, but imagine that this picture is as big as, as this screen, or bigger, right? Actually bigger. And what that is, is basically a representation of the world power system <laughs> in one map. So what it contains over there are national governments, government agencies, corporations, uh, business associations, research centers, lobby groups, interest groups, uh, Soros, Open Society Foundation, uh, trust funds, I mean anything you can imagine of as a center of power <coughs> of global significance right, is on that map. That map represents what the power centers are and it also represents the connections between these different power centers. Right? And there you have a, you know, an explanation of all the different icons. I mean, I, I really suggest you to, to, to have a look at that Bureau de Tout, that's the name of the group that uh, does the, these maps. And this map stems, uh, it dates back to 2002, right, 2003, right? It's once again this period uh, characterized by the presence of the anti-globalization movement, the big anti-corporate protest in uh, Seattle in 1999, in Prague in 2000, in Genoa in 2001. And these protests target these global institutions, right, that emerge as centers of power. The World Trade Organization that liberalizes markets, the World Bank that imposes uh, a certain financial line, the International Monetary Fund that uh, forces countries to restructure their economy to be more efficient, right, in their own, in its own terms. The G8, the Group of Eight, uh, the group of the eight most industrialized countries, at least that was what they were supposed to be back in the times, right? And it's interesting that at the same time when activists challenge these global institutions, artists, activists, or artivists, as they're, they're, they're called, what they were called around the time, uh, try to face the ch this challenge, right? Try to face this challenge of uh, developing an aesthetic that can match the scale of a globalized world. Uh, developing uh, forms of representation that can capture those complex global dynamics that are largely invisible to individuals, uh, but at the same time deeply influence our everyday life. Right? Uh, just think, for example, uh, the price of coffee on the New York Stock Exchange and its effects on a peasant in Mexico, for example, or uh, mm, flows of, of labor, flows of capital, flows of people, how all these flows influence our lives. So what these uh, forms of expression were trying to do was exactly to develop a language, right? A language to express those new concerns those new issues and the new conflicts 
who are emerging in space. So we now, uh, how many hours do I have to, to speak today? Um, yeah. Yeah. All right, because you say that speaks lower. It's not in the hard part. So it's fine. It's perfect. No, I mean, it's less. It's yeah. We can just yeah. talk. Yeah. We can yeah. just discuss things. Uh, yeah, speak for quarter an hour, two minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. All right, and then we get to to my own position in this. Uh, I mean, around the time when these things were happening, I was much younger than I'm now. Uh, presumably so, <laughs> and, and I was very, very, uh, I mean, I was a fanatic of this, this, this work. I mean, I was very interested in this as a person that was playing with these tools, with these technologies, and with a friend of mine, we uh, tried, we developed some works as part of this net, net art scene, right? And, and, and later in life, we continued to, to do uh, experiments trying to use info visualization as a means to express uh, emerging issues, as a means to express global issues, environmental issues, political issues, corruption, trafficking, and, uh, and other issues. So what you see there is, uh, is a screenshot from a, a project, a relatively uh, recent project we did, called ifondoalmar.info, that is the Italian for under the sea. So what the project did was to map out uh, a series of incidents involving ships suspected to carry radioactive or chemical waste. Right. So there was a very big story in the Italian media around 2009, 2010, and shortly before that, uh, according to which uh, a number of ships had been deli deliberately sunk in the Mediterranean Sea in order to get rid of toxic waste. Why? Because processing toxic waste legally has huge costs and all the sector of ecological mafia or eco-mafia has developed precisely trying to uh, leverage that gap between legal cost, I mean cost involved in processing waste legally and uh, illegal ways of disposing of, of, of toxic waste, right? Where billions and billions of euros in profit are made every year, right? And this is a very interesting issue because it is a very challenging issue, right? Because it's an issue that somehow is difficult to localize, <coughs> right? It is an issue that has huge effects on the ecosystem, on people, just think about the effects in terms of uh, rise in cancers that can be produced by uh, illegal disposal of waste. There is all an area of Campania, the uh, region near Naples, where toxic waste has been illegally disposed of with uh, ter terrible consequences for the people living in the area. I mean, we're really talking about uh, very scientifically well-proven evidence of spikes in the numbers of, of cancers specific cancers that are correlated with uh, exposure to toxic substances, right? We're talking about uh, I mean, several lives have been destroyed, people have died or who have survived the cancer, but who still carry the consequences. We're talking about uh, uh, very uh, harsh consequences on the local economy, right? On agriculture and so on and so forth. And when it comes to issues like these, it's difficult to represent them, right? And it's difficult to represent them, and it's something that I realized as a journalist. Uh, I've been working for a newspaper in Italy, and I've been covering uh, political issues, protest issues, and I got very interested in this story. And I started doing some research at, about this using the Lloyd's uh, uh, archive, the Naval Returns archive. So in the Lloyd's uh, historical building, there is an archive of naval returns. What is that? I mean, any, every time a ship has an accident, they need to file a return where they describe what has happened, right? Uh, what are the modalities of the incident? And then these uh, uh, reports are stored there, both in a paper database, and while it's quite unlucky, some of them were still in the paper database, right? Or they are digitized and they are available in the digital database. 
So the problem with a case like this was that it's difficult to render by using uh, sort of the, the usual techniques of uh, the usual formats of written journalism. Why is it difficult? Because in a story like this, where you have 70, 72 incidents, that is, all 72 ships that have been sunk in the Mediterranean Sea, it is difficult to find a, a linear way, a linear story, to describe uh, the, the, the issue. Right? Just to show you that website. So we thought that the best way to capture the complexity of the phenomenon, the multiplicity of the phenomenon, the fact that it was not one incident but several <laughs> incidents involved, was precisely to use the language of Infovis and more specifically the language of Google Map based Infovis, uh, developing an archive that users could uh, navigate as to educate themselves about the issue to understand the issue. So basically people can browse through the system in different ways, either through the map, or there is a timeline, there is a statistic section where people can see what those ships were carrying, how many of those ships were supposedly carrying marble, because marble is, uh, um, how do you say, it, it screens radiation. So the ships that are carrying marble are among the most suspicious ones because it's suspected that marble was used actually to screen radiation, that it was kind of radioactive substances there, and that marble was used simply to cover the fact, uh, to avoid that inspectors at, at ports would notice the presence of a suspicious material. So what this project tries to do is, is to, uh, excuse me for that, Timeline there. It's populating. All right, what do you think is important in the timeline, right? Is that you see that there are certain years that are particularly intense in terms of, 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 of incidents, right? And others where there are few incidents. I mean, according to now experts have spoken to, the normal number of incidents in the Mediterranean, which is not really a tempest to see, it's not really, you know, it was back for the ancient Greeks and Romans, it was a very scary scene. Right? But nowadays, with the level of technology we have, kind of normal, average statistical number of incidents, of sinkings, is one, one per year. Right? That's what is considered normal. But you can see that there were certain years where like nine ships were sunk, or five, six, three, right? So what is interesting there is that it really shows that there is a, a, a pattern, right? That there is a clear pattern. There are some clear statistical irregularities that point to something that is just not right, right? Also, for example, the uh, crowding of incidents in areas where the sea is deep. Look at this. You can see the depth of the sea. Right? You can see that where the sea is deeper, you have more incidents. Right? For example, in this area, where the sea is very deep. In the Aegean Sea. Right? So what this project tries to do is to provide uh, a language, once again, to, to get to grips with this problem that is very difficult to uh, it's very difficult otherwise to represent, to, uh, to get to grips with. Having talked about the front of map, I want to, uh, all right, we just a series of things on this project. So what was very comforting for us was to see that this project got very high volume of traffic. I mean, sometimes like uh, thousands of contacts a week was featured on Sky News and main news media, but possibly the most uh, rewarding thing for us was that the, among the users was the police, the environmental police, the army, the Ministry of Interior, right? Which was very curious because somehow it showed how uh, 
even the environmental police or the army didn't have a clue of what was going on, right? It, they were looking at our representation of, of, of the issue. And, and the project was uh, invited as a, as a guest project at Ars Electronica in Leeds back in 2010, where they printed out a map, right? Visible map, and people could basically see it from near and possibly not get <coughs> any radiation or toxic waste. So in this last chapter of, of my presentation, I want to look at what info visualization is now. And what info visualization is now at the time of social media and big data. When we see uh, a great number of, of uh, tools, applications, services, projects that are concerned with representing the space of social media, representing social media conversations. I'll give you some examples of this. So this, for example, is an Occupy Twitter network map, right? Uh, from Social Flow, if I'm correct, that shows the Twitter traffic there, right? So and you can clearly see certain, some very important things there. The dots are bigger or smaller according to the number of followers they have, right? And what you can see there is that there clearly is a, a hierarchy in the space, right? A counter to the assumption that we all often hear about the internet and social movements, that everything is horizontal, that everybody is just the same. What you see there is that there is a very big account, Occupy Wall Street, New York, and a very big account, Ambassadors, that there are some opinion makers with big accounts, right? But that all the other people, all the other people like us, say ordinary web browsers, are just tiny dots, right? We're just like small bombs. We can retweet, we can say our thoughts, our community will notice, right? But we will never break in sort of into the mainstream conversation. Other examples of that. I mean, this is a project done by a friend of mine, Pablo Reyman, that uh, has a very interesting website called numeroteca.org and this is for me the most sophisticated type of info visualization on social media that is available now. What this is, is uh, a correlation of Twitter traffic and uh, uh, front pages of newspapers. And that is very interesting because the question he asked himself is basically what we in Italy we call uh, did come first the, the, the egg or the chicken, right? That's how is there a similar expression in English, right? We say exactly, exactly the same. Right? We the chicken or the egg. The chicken or the egg, yeah. <laughs> you see? You see? That's the difference there. <laughs> and so basically, that's a question that many theories are concerned with, right? Many sociologists. So, for example, is, is it the case that people start talking about things in social media and then things get started? and then the news media picks up, pick up later, right? Or, it, or, or is that not the case? Is that contemporaneous? Or might even be the contrary. It is first news media who announce something and then social media basically reverberate that news. So what it shows clearly there is that A, hypothesis A is, is the right one, right? That is, it is first social media that initiate conversation and then somehow news media are, are the retro guard, right? The communicative retro guard. They pick up the news, they uh, inform people about what is happening, but at a time when the peaks in social media traffic are already uh, passed, right? So this refers to Kinsemen, to the movement of the Indignados in uh, Spain, starting in May 2011. It was a predecessor to Occupy Wall Street in, in the US. Right? And you can clearly see there that you know, this, this graph, there are these peaks of interest, and then, I mean, a bit later, the news media starts picking up on them, then there is this moment of very, very deep interest, right? There is this kind of condensation of interest, and then this interest starts fading away, right? And then again, there's another explosion here, right? It starts in social media, and then the news media 
kind of almost contemporaneously uh, report that. This is a similar project, it's a, a kind of a, a, a diachronic map, and this refers to step 45 or 3, right? And it's doing exactly the same kind of work. It's looking at the correlation between, uh, I'm sorry, in this case it is, it is a newspaper surface, right? This is a super representation of newspaper surface. So what these projects are interesting for is how they try to get to grips with questions that we ask ourselves, right, about the role of information, the role of data on our lives, the way in which data structure our lives and our, our relationships. Uh, the problem with many of these representations, as far as I'm concerned, is that they are quite static, right? So they give you a snapshot picture, right? Uh, a frozen picture, a frozen moment in time, right? And they show you the relationship between different nodes, different points in the network, but they don't really give you a sense of uh, the dynamic character of network communication, right? The fact that, for example, there is an account that starts and it has only 10 followers, and then that account suddenly so grows and grows and grows, right? And there is this process of growth that often escapes this type of representation. I mean, recently there have been attempts to reinsert a sense of motion and, uh, and dynamicity in these maps, in these uh, improvisualization. And an example of that is this uh, project by by the University of Saragossa, the Department of Physics and, uh, and Informatics. And what this does is a representation of Twitter traffic around the, the Indignados movement in Spain in May 2011. that information is not just a network, it's not just a structure that is there, durable and uh, rigid, but it's actually the, pro the product of ongoing interactions, right, that evolve through time. Again. So just to conclude uh, this presentation, I'll uh, just try to uh, make, make some points, some reflections. Uh, first and foremost, input visualization is not just a technical operation. It is a political operation as well. It is an operation that has all forms of, of uh, representation and as all forms of mapping involves questions of power, involves decisions that are fundamentally political decisions. Starting from what do you want to represent? What variables are you going to use to represent that? What are you going to concentrate on, right, in your representation? What are you going to focus on? 
And we know that maps have traditionally been uh, a royal science, that is a science of power, right? A science used by colonizers, a science used to conquer the world. I mean, and the question is, can mapping as a broad set of practices be reclaimed by citizens, by civil society, by protest movements? And in particular on social media maps, I think there are some limits there that are interesting to identify precisely to do some new and more creative work on info visualization as a means of investigation. First, these maps are mostly static. They are omnicomprehensive, right? That is, they, uh, they show us communication from this God's eye view perspective, right? Which is useful for getting certain things, but is used less for getting other things. It's useful for getting a sense of how the space is organized as a whole, but not for getting a sense of how specific actors operate there. Then I would say it's also quite a structuralist type of representation that is, is concerned not much with content, but more with the channels of communication. And it's somehow quite ambiguous. That is, while these maps are often considered, also by many sociologists who use them, to analyze social media traffic as a kind of hard science type of representation, actually they're quite ambiguous. People can read different things in them. So for example, there are some people who looking at a Twitter map, just like the one I showed you before on Occupy, were claiming, look at that. That's the proof that the movement is horizontal. How is that horizontal? There are centers. No, but there are many centers, right? while somebody else coming from a different perspective might say precisely the opposite. Look, it is a vertical space. It is a kind of hierarchical space. Right? So there are all these different elements that are needs that need to be uh, taken into account when, uh, when working with information visualization. And I think that that's the kind of question that I would like to, to, uh, to discuss with you. That is, how can we use these practices as a means to get to grips with the questions around us, uh, both in our, say, in our everyday <coughs> life, but also as researchers, as part of a research strategy. Thanks. Thanks. <coughs>